Hey Panthers, Miss Ricker here for chapter 17, which is actually our last chapter of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I cannot believe that we are coming to the conclusion of this book already. I hope you have enjoyed our visit to Hogwarts and the Wizarding World, and I hope you enjoyed the fantastic finale of the first book. Let's get started. So chapter 16 left us in a little bit of a cliffhanger yesterday, and it ended with somebody being in the room with Harry Potter, and they said, well, it wasn't Snape, it wasn't Voldemort. So this chapter is going to tell us who is waiting in that room with Harry Potter. Chapter 17 is called The Man with Two Faces. It was Coral. You, gasped Harry. Coral smiled. His face wasn't twitching at all. Me, he said calmly. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. But I, Snape <laughs> Severus, Coral laughed, and it wasn't his usual quivering, quivering, but cold and sharp. Yes, Severus doesn't seem does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like an overgrown bat. Next to him, who would suspect? P -p 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 Poor says the stuttering P -p Professor Coral. Here he couldn't take it. This couldn't be true. It couldn't. But Snape tried to kill me. No, no, no. I tried to kill you. Your friend Miss Granger accidentally knocked me over as she rushed to set fire to Snape at that Quidditch match. She broke my eye contact with you. Another few seconds and I've gotten you off of that broom. I'd have managed to it before than if Snape hadn't been muttering a counter curse trying to save you. Snape was trying to save me? Of course, said Coral coolly. Why do you think he wanted to referee your next match? He was trying to make sure I didn't do it again. Funny, really. He needn't have bothered. I couldn't have done anything with Dumbledore watching. All the other teachers thought Snape was trying to stop Gryffindor from winning. He did make himself unpopular. And what a waste of time. When after all of that, I'm going to kill you tonight. Coral snapped his fingers. Ropes sprang out of thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around Harry. You're too nosy to live, Potter. Scurrying around the school on Halloween like that, for all I know, you see me coming to look at what was guarding the stone. You let the troll in? Certainly. I have a special gift with trolls. You must have seen what I did to the one in the chamber back there. Unfortunately, while everyone else was running around looking for it, Snape, who already suspected me, went straight to the third floor to head me off. And not only did my troll fail to beat you to death, that three-headed dog didn't even manage to bite off Snape's leg properly. Now wait quietly, Potter. I need to examine this interesting mirror. It was only then that Harry realized that what was standing behind Coral, it was the mirror of Erased. The mirror is the key to finding the stone, Coral murmured, tapping his wand around the frame. Trust Dumbledore to come up with something like this, but he's in London. I'll be far away by the time he gets back. All Coral could think of doing was to all, excuse me, all Harry could think of doing was to keep Coral talking and stop him from concentrating on the mirror. I saw you and Snape in the forest, he blurted out. Yes, Coral said idly, walking around the mirror to look at the back. He was on to me by that time, trying to find out how far I'd got. He suspected me all along, tried to frighten me as though he could when I had Lord Voldemort on my side. Coral came back out from behind the mirror and stared hungrily. I see the stone. I'm presenting it to my master, but where is it? Harry struggled against the ropes binding him, but they didn't give. He had to keep Coral from giving his whole attention to the mirror. But Snape always seemed to hate me so much. Oh, he does, said Coral casually. Heavens, yes. He was at Hogwarts with your father, didn't you know? They loathed each other, but he never wanted you dead. But I heard you a few days ago sobbing. I thought Snape was threatening you. For the first time, a spasm of fear flitted across Coral's face. Sometimes, he said, I find, it, I find it hard to follow my master's instructions. He is a great wizard and I am weak. You mean he was there in the classroom with you? Harry gasped. He is with me wherever I go, said Coral quietly. I met him when I traveled around the world. A foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. Lord Voldemort showed me how wrong I was. There is no good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. Since then, I have served him faithfully, although I have let him down many times. He has to be very hard on me. Coral shivered suddenly. He does not forgive mistakes easily. When I failed to steal the stone from Ringgourds, he was most displeased. He punished me, decided he would have to keep a closer watch on me. Coral's voice trailed away. Harry was remembering his trip to Diagon Alley. How could he have been so stupid? He'd seen Coral there that very day, shaken hands with him in the leaky cauldron. Coral cursed under his breath. 
I don't understand. Is the stone inside the mirror? Should I break it? Harry's mind was racing. What I want more than anything else in the world at the moment, he thought, is to find the stone before Coral does. So if I look into the mirror, I should see myself finding it, which means I'll see where it's hidden. But how can I look without Coral realizing what I'm doing? He tried, tried to the edge of the left to get in front without Coral noticing, but the ropes around his ankles were too tight. He tripped and fell over. Coral ignored him. He was still talking to himself. What does this mirror do? How does it work? Help me, master. And to Harry's horror, a voice answered, and the voice seemed to come from Coral himself. Use the boy. Use the boy. Coral rounded on Harry. Yes, Potter, come here. He clapped his hands once, and the ropes binding Harry fell off. Harry got slowly to his feet. Come here. Coral repeated, look into this mirror and tell me what you see. Harry walked towards him. I must lie, he thought desperately. I must look and lie about what I see. Coral moved close behind him. Harry breathed in the funny smell that seemed to come from Coral's turban. He closed his eyes, stepped in front of the mirror, and opened them again. He saw his reflection, scared and scared looking and pale at first. But a moment later, the reflection smiled at him. It put in his hands into a pocket and pulled out a blood red stone. It winked and put the stone back in his pocket. And as it did so, Harry felt something heavy drop into his real pocket. Somehow, incredibly, he'd gotten the stone. Well, said Coral impatiently, what do you see? Harry screwed up his courage. I see myself shaking hands with Dumbledore, he invented. I, I've won the house cup for Gryffindor. Coral cursed again. Get out of the way, he said, as Harry moved aside. He left the, He felt the sorcerer's stone against his leg. Dare he make a break for it? But he hadn't walked five paces before a high voice spoke through Coral's, though Coral's lips were, Blah, 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 blah. Sorry, got a little messed up on that line. But he hadn't walked five paces before a high voice spoke, though Coral wasn't moving his lips. He lies, he lies. Potter, come back here, Coral shouted. Tell me the truth. What do you see? The high voice spoke again. Let me see him face to face. Master, you are not strong enough. I have enough strength for this. Harry felt as if Devil Snare was rooting him to a spot. He couldn't move a muscle. Petrified, he watched as Coral reached up and began to unwrap his turban. What was going on? The turban fell away. Coral's head looked strangely small without it, though he turned slowly on the spot. Harry would have screamed, but he couldn't make a sound. Where there should have been a back to Coral's head, there was a face. The most terrible face Harry had ever seen. It was chalk white with glaring red eyes and slits for nostrils like a snake. Harry Potter, it whispered. Harry tried to take a step backwards, but his legs wouldn't move. See what I have become, the face said. Mere shadow and vapor. I have form only when I can share another's body. But there has always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has strengthened me. These past weeks you saw faithful coral drinking it for me in the forest. And once I have the elixir of life, I will be able to create a body of my own. Now... Why don't you give me that stone in your pocket? So he knew. The feeling suddenly surged back into Harry's leg. He stumbled backwards. Don't be a fool, snarled the face. Better save your own life and join me, or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Liar, Harry shouted suddenly. Coral was walking backwards at him so that Baltimore could still see him. The evil face was now smiling. How touching, it hissed. I always value bravery. Yes, boy, your parents were brave. I killed your father first, and he put up a courageous fight. But your mother needn't died. She was trying to protect you. Now give me the stone, unless you never wanted her to have died in vain. Never! Harry sprang towards the flame door, but Voldemort screamed, Seize him! And the next second, Harry felt Coral's hand close on, close on his wrist. At once, a needle-sharp pain seared across Harry's scar. His head felt as though it was about to split into two. He yelled, struggling with all his might, and to his surprise, Coral let go of him. 
the pain in his head lessened. He looked around wildly to see if Coral had gone and saw him hunched in pain, looking in his fingers. They were blistering before his eyes. Seize him, seize him, shrieked Baltimore again. And Coral lunged, knocking Harry clean off of his feet, landing on top of him. Both hands around Harry's neck. Harry's scar was almost blinding him with pain. Yet he could see Coral howling in anger, angrily. Master, I cannot hold him. My hands, my hands. And Coral, though pinning Harry to the ground with his knees, let go of his neck and stared, bewildered at his own palms. Harry could see they looked burned, raw, red, and shiny. Then kill him, fool, and me done, screeched Baltimore. Coral raised his hands to perform a deadly curse, but Harry, by instinct, reached up and grabbed Coral's face. Ah! Coral rolled off of him. His face was blistering, too. And then Harry knew. Coral couldn't touch his bare skin, with not without suffering terrible pain. His only chance was to keep hold of Coral, keep him in enough pain to stop him from doing a curse. Harry jumped to his feet, caught Coral by the arm, and hung on as tight as he could. Coral screamed and tried to throw Harry off. The pain in Harry's head was building. He couldn't see. He could only hear Coral's terrible shrieks and Baltimore's yells of kill him, kill him, and other voices maybe in Harry's own head crying, Harry, Harry. He felt Coral's arm wrenched from his grasp, knew all was lost, and fell into the blackness, down, down, down. Something gold was glittering just above him, the snitch. He tried to catch it, but his arms were too heavy. He blinked. It wasn't the snitch. It was a pair of glasses. How strange. He blinked again. The smiling face of Albus Dumbledore swam into the view above him. Good afternoon, Harry, said Dumbledore. Harry stared at him. Then he remembered, sir, the stone. It was Coral. He's got the stone, sir, quick. Calm yourself, dear boy. You are a little behind the time, said Dumbledore. Coral does not have the stone. Then who does, sir? I, Harry, please relax or Madame Pomfrey will have me thrown out. Harry swallowed and looked around him. He realized he must be in the hospital wing. He was lying in bed with white linen sheets and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the candy shop. Tokens from your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Coral is a complete secret. So naturally, the whole school knows. I believe your friends, Mr. Fred and George Weasley, were responsible for trying to send you a toilet seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you. Madame Pomfrey, however, felt it might not be very hy hygienic and confiscated it. How long have I been here? Three days. Mr. Ronald Weasley and Miss Granger will be most relieved you have come around. They have been extremely worried. But, sir, the stone... I see you are not to be distracted. Very well, the stone. Professor Coral did not manage to take it from you. I arrived in time to prevent that, although you were doing very well on your own, I must say. You got there? You got Hermione's owl? We must have crossed in midair. No sooner had I reached London that it became clear to me that the place I should be was the one I just had I had just left. I arrived just in time to pour, pull Coral off of you. It was you. I feared I might be too late. You nearly were. I couldn't have kept him off the stone much longer. Not the stone, boy. You. The effort involved nearly killed you. For one terrible moment there, I was afraid it had. As for the stone, it has been destroyed. Destroyed? Said Harry blankly. But your friend, Nicholas Flamel. Oh, you know about Nicholas, said Dumbledore, sounding quite delighted. You did do the thing properly, didn't you? Well, Nicholas and I have had a little chat and agreed it's all for the best. But that means him and his wife will die, won't they? They have enough elixir stored in, to set their affairs in order and then yes they will die dumbledore smiled at the look of amazement on harry's face the one as young as you i'm sure it seems to one as young as you i'm sure it seems incredible but to nicholas and pernell it really is like going to bed after a very 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 long day after all to the well-organized mind death is but the next great adventure you know the stone was really not such a wonderful thing as much money in life as you could want the two things most human beings would choose above all the trouble is humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worse for them. Harry lay there, lost for words. Dumbledore hummed a little and smiled at him. Sir, I've been thinking. Sir, even if the stone's gone, fall, I mean, you know who. Call him Voldemort, Harry. Always use the proper name for things. Fear of a name increases the fear of the thing itself. Yes, sir. Well, Voldemort's going to try other ways of coming back, isn't he? I mean, he hasn't gone, has he? No, Harry, he is not. He is still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share. Not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. He left Quarrel to die. He shows just as little mercy to his followers as his enemies. Nevertheless, Harry, while you may only have delayed his return to power, it will merely take someone else who is prepared to fight what seems a losing battle next time. And if he is delayed again and again, why he may never return to power. 
Harry nodded, but stopped quickly because it made his head hurt. Then he said, sir, there are some other things I'd like to know. If you can tell me things I want to know the truth about. The truth, Dumbledore sighed. It is a beautiful and terrible thing and should therefore be treated with great caution. However, I shall answer your questions unless I have, excuse me, a very good reason not to. In which case, I'll beg you'll forgive me. I shall not, of course, lie. Well, Voldemort said the only that he only killed my mother because she tried to stop him from killing me. But why would he want to kill me in the first place? Dumbledore sighed very deeply this time. Alas, the first thing you ask me, I cannot tell you. Not today, not now. You will know one day. Put it far from your mind for now. Harry, when you are older, I know you hate to hear this. When you are ready, you will know. And Harry knew it was no good to argue. But why couldn't Quirrell touch me? Your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love is as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. Not a scar, not a visible sign to have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very skin. Coral, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort, could not touch you for this reason. It was agony, agony to touch a person marked by something so good. Dumbledore now became very interested in a bird out on the window seal, which gave Harry time to dry his eyes on the sheet. When he found his voice again, Harry asked, in the invisib invisibility cloak, do you know who sent it to me? Ah, your father happened to leave it in my possession, and I thought you might like it. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled. Useful things. Your father used it mainly for sneaking off to the kitchen to steal food when he was here. And there's something else. Fire away. Quirrell said Snape. Professor Snape Perry. Yes, him. Quirrell said he hates me because he hated my father. Is that true? Well, they did rather detest each other, not unlike yourself and Mr. Malfoy. And then your father did something Snape could never forgive. What? He saved his life. What? Yes, said Dumbledore dreamily. Funny the ways people mind works, isn't it? Professor Snape couldn't bear being in your father's debt. I do believe he worked so hard to protect you this year because he felt that would make him and your father even. Then he could go back to hating your father's memory in peace. Harry tried to understand this, but it had made his head pound, so he stopped. And sir, there's one more thing. Just the one? How did I get the stone out of the mirror? Huh, now, I'm glad you asked me about that. It was one of my more brilliant ideas, and between you and me, that's saying something. You see, the only one who wanted to find the stone, find it, but not use it, would be able to get it. Otherwise, they just see themselves making gold or drinking the elixir of life. My brain surprises even me sometimes. Now, enough questions. I suggest you make a start on these sweets. Ah, Birdie Bots, every flavor beans. I was fortunate enough in my youth to come across a vomit-flavored one, and since then, I'm afraid I'm rather lost my liking for them. But I think I'll be safe with a nice toffee, don't you? He smiled and popped the golden brown bean into his mouth. Then he choked and said, alas, earwax. Madame Pomfry, the nurse, was a very nice woman, but very strict. Just five minutes, Harry pleaded. Absolutely not. You let Professor Dumbledore in? Well, of course. That was the headmaster. Quite different. You need rest. I am resting. Look, lying down and everything. Oh, go on, Madame Pomfry. Prom Fry. Oh, very well, she said, but five minutes only. And she let Harry and she let Ron and Hermione in. Harry! Hermione looked ready to fling her arms around him, but Harry was glad she held herself in as his head was still very sore. Oh, Harry, we were sure you were going to. Dumbledore was so worried. The whole school's talking about it, said Ron. What really happened? It was one of those rare occasions when the true story is even more strange and exciting than the wild rumors. Harry told them everything. Coral, the mirror, the stone, and Voldemort. Ron and Hermione were a very good audience. They gasped in all the right places. And when Harry told them what was under Coral's turban, Hermione screamed out loud. So the stone's gone, said Ron finally. Flamel's just going to die? That's what I said, but Dumbledore thinks, what was it? To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. I always said he was off his rocker, said Ron, looking quite impressed at how crazy his hero was. So what happened to you two, said Harry. Well, I got back all right, said Hermione. I brought Ron round, that took a while, and we were dashing up to the hourly to contact Dumbledore when we met him in the entrance hall. He already knew. He just said, Harry's gone after him, hasn't he? And hur hurtled off to the third floor. Do you think he meant to do it, said Ron, sending you your father's cloak and everything? Well, Hermione exploded. If he did, I mean to say, that's terrible. You could have been killed. No, it isn't, said Harry thoughtfully. He's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted to get... I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know. I reckon he had a pretty good idea we were going to try. And instead of stopping, excuse me, instead of stopping us, 
He just taught us enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out how the mirror worked. It's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. Yeah, Dumbledore's off as a rocker, all right, said Ron proudly. Listen, you've got to get up for the end of your feast tomorrow. The points are all in, and Slytherin, of course, won. You missed the last Quidditch match. We were steamrolled by Ravenclaw without you. But the food will be good. At that moment, Madame Promphy bustled over. You've had nearly 15 minutes now out, she said firmly. After a good night's sleep, Harry felt nearly back to normal. I want to go to the feast, he told Madame Pomfry as she straightened his many candy boxes. I can, can I? Professor Dumbledore says you are you are to be allowed to go, she said sniffily, as though in her opinion, Professor Dumbledore didn't realize how risky feasts could be. And you have another visitor. Oh, good, said Harry. Who is it? Hagrid slidled through the door as he spoke, and as usual, when he was indoors, Hagrid looked too big to be allowed. He sat down next to Harry, took one look at him, and burst into tears. It's all my fault, he sobbed, his face and hands. I told the evil get how to get past Fluffy. I told him it was the only thing he didn't know, and I told him you could have died. All for a dragon egg. I'm never doing that again. I should be chucked out of here to live as a muggle. Hagrid! said Harry, shocked to see Hagrid shaking with grief and remorse, great tears leaking down into his beard. Hagrid, you have found out somehow. This is Voldemort we're talking about. He'd have found out if you hadn't told him. You could have died, so sobbed Hagrid. And don't say the name, Voldemort, Harry bellowed, and Hagrid was shocked. He stopped crying. I've met him and I'm calling him by his name. Please cheer up, Hagrid. We've saved the stone. It's gone, but he can't use it. Here, have a chocolate frog. I've got loads. Hagrid wiped his nose on the back of his hand and said, that reminds me, I've got you a present. It's not a stout sandwich, is it? Said Harry anxiously. And at last, Hagrid gave a weak chuckle. Nah, Dumbledore gave me the day off to fix it. Of course, he should have sacked me instead. Anyway, got you this. It seemed to be a handsome leather covered book. Harry opened it curiously. It was full of wizard's photographs, smiling and waving at him from every page were his mother and father. Send Al off to all your parents' old school friends asking for photos. Knew you didn't have any. Do you like it? Harry couldn't speak, but Hagrid understood. Harry made his way down to the end of the year feast alone that night. He had been held up by Madame Pomfrey's fussing about, insisting on giving him one last checkup, so the great hall was already full. It was decked out in the Slytherin colors of green and silver to celebrate Slytherin's winning the House Cup for the seventh year in a row. A huge banner showing the Slytherin serpent covered the wall behind the high table. When Harry walked in, there was a sudden hush, and everybody started talking loudly at once. He slipped into a seat between Ron and Hermione at the Gryffindor table and tried to ignore the fact that people were standing up to look at him. Fortunately, Dumbledore arrived moments later. The babble died away. Another year gone, Dumbledore said cheerfully, and I must trouble you with an old man's wheezing waffle before we sink our teeth into a delicious feast. What a year it has been. Hopefully your heads are all a little fuller than they were. You have the whole summer ahead to get a nice, nice and empty before next year starts. Now, as I understand it, the, the house cup here needs a warding, and the points stand thus. In fourth place, Gryffindor with 312 points. In third place, Hufflepuff with 352 points. Ravenclaw has 426 points, and Slytherin, 472. A storm of cheering and stamping broke out from Slytherin table. Harry could see Draco Malfoy banging his goblet on the table. It was a sickening sight. Yes, yes, well done, Slytherin, said Dumbledore. However, recent events must be taken into account. The room went very still. Still, the Slytherin smiles faded a little. Ahem, said Dumbledore. I have a few last minute points to dish out. Let me see. Yes, first to Mr. Ronald Weasley. Ron went purple in the face. He looked like a radish with a bad sunburn. For the best played game of chess Hogwarts has seen in many years, I award Gryffindor 50 points. Gryffindor cheered nearly, cheers nearly raised the bewitched ceiling. The stars overheard seemed to quit overhead seemed to quiver. Percy could be heard telling the other prefects, my brother, you know, my youngest brother got past McGonagall's giant chess set. At last there was silence. Second to Miss Hermione Granger for the use of cool logic in the face of fire. I award Gryffindor house 50 points. Hermione buried her face in her arms. Harry strongly suspected she had burst into tears. Gryffindors up and down the table were beside themselves. They were up a hundred points. Third, to Mr. Potter, to Mr. Harry Potter, said Dumbledore. The room went deadly quiet. 
through pure nerve and outstanding courage, I award Gryffindor House 60 points. The din was deafening. Those who could add up while yelling themselves hoarse knew that Gryffindor now had 472 points, exactly the same as Slytherin. They had tied for the House Cup. If only Dumbledore had given Harry just one more point, Dumbledore raised his hand. The room gradually fell silent. There are all kinds of courage, said Dumbledore, smiling. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I, therefore, award 10 points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. Someone standing outside the Great Hall must have thought some sort of explosion had taken place. So loud was the noise that erupted from the Gryffindor table. Harry, Ron, and Hermione stood up to yell and cheer as Neville, white with shock, disappeared under a pile of people hugging him. He had never won so much a point for Gryffindor before. Harry, still cheering, nudged Ron in the ribs and pointed at Malfoy, who couldn't have looked more stunned and horrified if he had just had the body bind curse put on him. Which means, Dumbledore called over the storm of applause from even Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff were celebrating the downfall of, downfall of Slytherin, we need a little change of decoration. He clapped his hands in an instant. The green hangings became scarlet and the silver became gold. The huge Slytherin serpent vanished and a towering Gryffindor lion took its place. Snape was shaking P Professor McGonagall's hand with a horrible forced smile. He caught Harry's eye, and Harry knew at once that Snape's feelings towards him hadn't changed one jot. This didn't worry Harry. It seemed as though life would be back to normal next year, or as normal as it ever was at Hogwarts. It was the best evening of Harry's life, better than winning at Quidditch or Christmas or knocking out mountain trolls. He would never, ever forget tonight. Harry had almost forgotten that the exam results were still to come out, but they did co come they did. To their great surprise, both he and Ron passed with good marks. Hermione, of course, had the best grades of the first years. Even Neville scraped through his good herbology marks, making up for his abysmal potions ones. They had hoped that Boyle, who was, was almost as stupid as he was mean, might be thrown out, but he had passed too. It was a shame, but as Ron said, you couldn't have everything in life. And suddenly, their wardrobes were empty, their trunks were packed. Neville's toad was found lurking in the corner of the toilets. Notes were handed out to all the students, warning them not to use magics over the holidays. I always hope they'll forget to give us these, said Fred Weasley sadly. Hagrid was there to take them down to the fleet of boats that sailed across the lake. They were boarding the Hogwarts Express, talking and laughing as the countryside became greener and tidier, eating Bertie's Bots every flavor beans as they sped past Muggle Towns, pulling off their wizard robes and putting on jackets and coats, pulling into Platform 9 and 3 quarters at King's Cross Station. It took quite a while for them to all get off the platform. A wizard, uh, excuse me. A wizened old guard was up by the ticket barrier, letting them go through the gate in twos and threes so they didn't attract attention by all bursting out of a solid wall at once and alarming the muggles. You must come and stay this summer, said Ron. Both of you, I'll send you an owl. Thanks, said Harry. I'll need something to look forward to. People jostled them as they moved forward towards the gateway back to the muggle world. Some of them called, bye, Potter. See you, Harry. Still famous, said Ron, grinning at him. Not where I'm going, I promise you, said Harry. He, Ron, and Hermione passed through the gateway together. There he is, Mom, there he is, look. It was Ginny Weasley, Ron's younger, si younger sister, but she wasn't pointing at Ron. Harry Potter, she squealed. Mom, look, I can see. Be quiet, Ginny, and it's rude to point. Mrs. Weasley smiled down at them. Busy year, she said. Very, said Harry. Thanks for the fudge and the sweater, Mrs. Weasley. Oh, it was nothing, dear. Ready, are you? It was Uncle Vernon, still purple face, still mustache, still looking furious at the nerve of Harry, carrying an owl in a cage in a station full of ordinary people. Behind him stood Aunt Petunia and Dudley, looking terrified at the very sight of Harry. You must be Harry's family, said Mrs. Weasley. In a manner of speaking, said Uncle Vernon. Hurry up, boy, we haven't got all day. He walked away. Harry hung back for a last word with Ron and Hermione. See you over the summer then? Hope you have a, a good holiday, said Hermione, looking uncertainly after Uncle Vernon, shocked that anyone could be so unpleasant. Oh, I will, said Harry, and they were surprised at the grin that was spreading over their face. They don't know we're not allowed to use magic at home. I'm going to have a lot of fun with Dudley this summer. And that is the end of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Like I said before, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, there are six more books in the series. I know a couple of our friends in third grade, um, have been reading the books and they're actually on book seven. So that's very exciting. So our last question for Harry Potter is, 
What man was trying to steal the sorcerer's stone? What man was trying to steal the sorcerer's stone? Technically two different two different people for this one. You could put either of their names. And here's our last video clip of Harry 